in the name of Allah, peace and blessing be upon you. In the beginning, I would like to welcome my friend, uh, uh, Secretary Blinken. And after uh, our meeting today, which is a continuation for a series of discussion, an important dialogue that uh, took place over uh, the previous uh, month uh, uh, after the war uh, started in Gaza and uh, uh, pathways to end that uh, war and to prevent this war from uh, expand in the region. And as you all know, uh, we have uh, also discussed uh, the response that we have received from Hamas and the Palestinian uh, fractions uh, on the last uh, proposal uh, on the, to stop the war and uh, release uh, uh, the hostages and of course in coordination with the uh, other uh, uh, partner and we would like to confirm that the state of Qatar and Egypt and the United States of America are committed uh, in their partnership in order to uh, uh, find an, uh, an ending to this war and a deal to exchange uh, the hostages uh, and in this also uh, regard, we highly uh, evaluate uh, the effort, uh, efforts uh, that President Biden have exhorted in order to uh, reach uh, th this uh, proposal in a, uh, a text, uh, in a way to bring together the uh, uh, parties. And as we have mentioned in many previous uh, stops, that in such uh, deal uh, both uh, parties need to uh, uh, make some concession in order to reach uh, uh, a suitable arrangement and reach uh, a deal. We in the state of Qatar with our partners committed to bridge the gap to find uh, uh, a way to uh, end the war as soon as uh, possible and we would like uh, to send a message to everyone that every day is uh, a loss of lives uh, and uh, of innocent uh, people every day that uh, passed in the previous eight months. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen the catastrophe increasing day after day, and we see more uh, casualties, especially of the civilians with their children, women in Gaza uh, Strip. And uh, w with no doubt, we need uh, to take a clear position and demand uh, to put an end to this uh, war. Uh, 37,000 37, martyrs have passed so far, died so far, and uh, thousands wounded. In addition to this uh, collective punishment policy and starvation that has been used uh, against our brothers in, the, in uh, Gaza, we are witnessing uh, also a change in this uh, conflict uh, in the previous uh, uh, time and uh, there is uh, a clear and firm call to uh, put an end uh, to this uh, war and uh, in this uh, also uh, regard we have uh, received uh, the Security Council uh, resolution which was presented by the United States of America for an immediate ceasefire and a deal to exchange uh, the hostages and go back to the uh, political uh, uh, negotiation to find a sustainable uh, solution. And we in the state of Qatar welcome uh, that uh, uh, resolution. In the previous uh, 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 time, there were so many meetings uh, and uh, regional conferences and international ones. We have uh, participated them in the state of Qatar in order to uh, find a sustainable uh, uh, solution to the Palestinian uh, uh, case. And also there, was, uh, there were visits uh, uh, in light of the ministerial committee uh, that have been uh, uh, established uh, and also uh, the meetings with the uh, uh, European uh, foreign ministers and yesterday we have participated in a conference uh, that, uh, for uh, 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 an immediate humanitarian response uh, uh, and by uh, the uh, call of uh, uh, King Abdullah II and uh, uh, the President uh, of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, and uh, the Secretary General of the United, uh, uh, United Nations, who call for an immediate action to end uh, this war uh, and uh, the respect of the international law. And also in this regard, we welcome also the continuation of the air uh, uh, support or air drop uh, uh, by uh, the uh, uh, Americans and and also we would like also uh, uh, 
uh, to praise your additional uh, uh, package of support to Gaza and the state of Qatar is continue with its efforts in order to send all uh, humanitarian aid uh, uh, continuously to our uh, uh, brothers. Uh, Your Excellency, you know that uh, we are living in very critical times uh, and uh, we believe that reaching uh, a deal, an agreement is very important and uh, this uh, deal will save uh, 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 the lives of the innocents and also will save the re whole uh, region which is on the verge uh, of uh, collapse and explosion and uh, we uh, uh, depend, uh, rely on the American role and our also partners uh, in Egypt and uh, the rest of the countries in order to pressure all the parties to reach an agreement that uh, uh, in this war. And Your Excellency, you know that uh, I believe that we have received uh, 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 it's time that we need to reach a sustainable uh, solution and today we have discussed uh, uh, discuss how to reach those sustainable solutions that uh, bring the stability to, uh, to, to Gaza and to our also brothers in the West Bank and to everyone that lives in this region. We believe that the sustainable uh, solution and is it a just one which is in a create a Palestinian uh, state uh, with the Jerusalem its capital based on the international uh, law on the borders of 1967 to live in peace uh, uh, alongside with Israel and uh, as you, you aware your excellency that uh, the region is uh, open to have uh, a clear uh, uh, peace uh, 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 agreement based on the Arab Peace Initiative uh, and uh, there is a movement in the uh, um, uh, General Assembly to uh, receive uh, Palestine or accept Palestine as a full member and this step will also contribute uh, to the two-state solution. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your uh, presence in Doha and for your continuous uh, cooperation and on our uh, strategic partner ship with the USA in this conflict on any other on, on, on other uh, 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 files and uh, issues. Well, first let me just say uh, it's very good to be back here in Doha and especially to be with my colleague and my friend, the, the Prime Minister. Uh, as you heard him say, we were together just yesterday in Jordan at a conference to work to rally more international support to address the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, Qatar has already shown remarkable generosity in helping people in such urgent need, uh, providing 4,700 tons of food, medicine, and other life-saving aid. Uh, at yesterday's conference, I announced uh, $400 million more in additional support from the United States to the Palestinians. That brings the total amount that we've uh, provided to $670 million in additional U.S. assistance uh, to uh, the uh, Palestinians in the eight months that this war has been going on. We've long been the leading provider of support to Palestinians, and we will continue to do everything we can to support them, particularly in this time of, uh, of need. We're also continuing to work every single day on increasing the flow of assistance into Gaza and making sure that it gets to people who need it within Gaza, working to improve civilian protection, working to secure the release of hostages. Now, the single most effective and most immediate way to end the suffering of people in Gaza to end the suffering of Palestinians and Israelis alike, to tackle the humanitarian assistance crisis, to prevent the conflict from further escalating and spreading to other places, is to get a ceasefire that allows us to get to work toward a more durable end to the conflict. Here again, Qatar has been a tireless partner, and the Prime Minister personally, a tireless partner in working to mediate a ceasefire and a hostage release. Uh, it's something that the Prime Minister and I first discussed here on October 13th and many times since. Twelve days ago, President Biden set out a ceasefire proposal rooted in core principles of releasing all the hostages, surging assistance into Gaza, guaranteeing Israel's security, providing a path to an enduring end to war, and starting the massive reconstruction for Gaza. The entire world 
almost without uh, fail, has been uh, behind this proposal. And we've heard it again and again and again. Individual countries pronouncing themselves in support in this region and beyond. Important groups like the G7, the Arab League, uh, Palestinian Authority, Israel, and of course, just two days ago, the United Nations Security Council. Leaders in the region that I've met with uh, over the last couple of days, they have reaffirmed that again and again and again. So we were waiting on one response, and that was the response from Hamas. And as the prime minister said, uh, last night we received a response. Hamas has proposed numerous changes to the proposal that was on the table. We discussed those changes last night with Egyptian colleagues and today with the prime minister. Some of the changes are workable, some are not. Here, in a nutshell, is where we stand. A deal was on the table that was virtually identical to the proposal that Hamas put forward on May the 6th. A deal that the entire world is behind, a deal Israel's accepted, and Hamas could have answered with a single word, yes. Instead, Hamas waited nearly two weeks and then proposed more changes, a number of which go beyond positions that it previously taken and accepted. As a result, uh, and you heard the Prime Minister say this, uh, the war that Hamas started on October 7th with this barbaric attack on Israel and on Israeli civilians will go on. More people will suffer. More Palestinians will suffer. More Israelis will suffer. But in the days ahead, we are going to continue to push on an urgent basis with our partners, with Qatar, uh, with Egypt, to try to close this deal. Because we know it's in the interests of Israelis, Palestinians, the region, indeed, the entire world. And we all agree that the deal has to be grounded in the principles of the ceasefire proposal that the entire international community supports. There's something else that's critical, and the Prime Minister alluded to it. It's also crucial that we get from the immediate ceasefire that we're working urgently to achieve to an enduring end. And in order to do that, and to do that effectively, um, we have to have plans for the day after the conflict ends in Gaza. And we need to have them as soon as possible. For months, we've been working with partners throughout the region on such a plan. And that was also a key focus of conversations I've had over the last couple of days. In the coming weeks, we will put forward proposals for key elements of a day after plan, including concrete ideas for how to manage governance, security, reconstruction. That plan is key to turning a ceasefire into an enduring end to the conflict, but also turning an end of war into a just and durable peace and using that peace, using that peace as a foundation for building a more integrated, a more stable, a more prosperous region. Over the course of uh, what's now my uh, eighth visit to the region since October 7th, everyone that I've engaged with has made clear that this is the path they want to pursue. Now, I can't speak for Hamas or answer for Hamas, and ultimately, it may not be the path that Hamas wants to pursue. But Hamas cannot and will not be allowed to decide the future for this region and its people. نفتح الآن المجال للأسئلة السؤال الأول من قناة الجزيرة العربية عدنان بوري عدنان بوري من قناة الجزيرة to your excellency uh, prime minister regarding the response of uh, Hamas on the proposal are we talking about uh, and, and take and give with the officials of uh, Hamas with the mediator or the comment on the amendments will be uh, for the Israeli to respond. And the other question for Secretary Blinken, which is uh, about your eight, uh, eight visits uh, to the region. We're talking about 
uh, eight visits uh, so far. During those uh, visits, uh, you and other uh, uh, American officials, you have met with the families of the Israeli hostages. Were there any attempts uh, to meet with the families of the wounded uh, or uh, uh, th those who died uh, uh, of the Palestinians or those who even who were wounded uh, on the hands of the settlers or even in Gaza? For example, in uh, uh, Doha here, there are two thousands of the Palestinian uh, patients or wounded who came here for uh, uh, treatment. Thank you very much. Concerning your uh, question, yesterday we have received the response, and as we have said in the statement, now we are studying the response, and of course they will be give and take uh, um, with the Hamas or negotiation with them in order, or with the Israelis in order to bridge the gap between the uh, both positions. Of course, th those are not a new uh, efforts or not a new dynamic uh, for the negotiation. Usually, uh, there is a space uh, for uh, uh, negotiation because, after all, it's negotiation to reach an agreement, a deal. There is uh, no uh, um, absolute uh, 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 response, yes or no. So we wish that uh, this uh, time of negotiation will be the shortest. We wanted to have more momentum and movement. However. Uh, unfortunately, we have faced so many challenges in the, as we have said, we are committed. We want to uh, present uh, uh, a proposal so that we bring both uh, parties closer. Thank you. Um, when I was in Jordan, I believe it was on my last trip to the region, it may have been the one before that. Uh, I met with um, a remarkable group of women who had managed to leave Gaza uh, to get out, uh, are now in Jordan, uh, but have left family members behind, have lost family members, and I heard directly from them everything that they'd experienced and everything that their family members who remain in Gaza continue to experience. In the United States, I've met with um, Palestinian Americans who have family uh, in Gaza, uh, including family members who've been killed or terribly injured over the course of these eight months. Um, I carry with me um, a little pamphlet that one of, um, one of these um, individuals gave me with pictures of his family members, including a little one-year-old boy who was killed in Gaza. And I have to tell you that their stories, their suffering, that motivates me. Just as the suffering of the hostages and the suffering of those who were slaughtered on October 7th motivates me to do everything possible to bring this conflict to an end and to put us on a path to durable peace and security. Because at the end of the day, this is exactly about what you suggested. It's about the men, the women, the children, whether they're in uh, Gaza, uh, whether they're in, um, in Israel, uh, and we have to, we have to be looking out for them. Um, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The, the biggest poison in our common well that we all have to drink from is dehumanization the inability to see the humanity in someone else. And when that happens, when hearts get hardened, it's very hard to do anything. It's very easy to justify anything. So we have to push beyond that. And the most important way to do that is to always have in mind what little girls, little boys, women, men are going through as we speak.
for you. Despite your intense efforts to pressure Hamas, they obviously don't seem to be accepting the deal as President Biden laid out, and the Israelis are character characterizing this as a flat-out rejection. Does Hamas's response count as a rejection of the deal in your view? Do you think the deal is essentially dead? And if not, what exactly is the U.S. diplomatic strategy now to try and keep these talks uh, alive and bring the parties closer together? And secondly, the U.S. has put all the emphasis on pressuring Hamas, uh, at least publicly. But do you think it might be time for the U.S. to put more pressure on Israel to move them closer towards accepting the permanent ceasefire that Hamas has asked for, even if that allows the group to survive in some form? Uh, and Prime Minister, um, even with the elaborate three-phase deal that's being created to try and bridge the divide between Israel and Hamas, we still seem to be stuck on the fundamental question of a temporary versus a permanent truce, um, which is effectively, will Israel allow Hamas to survive this? Do you think these negotiations can really be salvaged, and what is the risk to the region if these talks continue to fail? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, look, as I said, based on what we saw last night, um, the response from Hamas. Numerous changes proposed to the deal that was on the table and that the entire world has gotten behind, but some of those are workable changes. Some, as I said, are not. Um, I don't want to characterize it further, but, you know, at some point in a negotiation, and this has gone back and forth for a long time, you get to a point where if one side continues to change its demands, including uh, making demands um, and insisting on changes for things that it already accepted, you have to question whether they're proceeding in, in good faith or not. But based on what we've seen and what I've discussed with the prime minister and what we discussed with our Egyptian colleagues, uh, we're determined to try to bridge the, uh, the gaps. And I believe those gaps are bridgeable. Doesn't mean they will be bridged because, again, it ultimately depends on people saying yes. But here's the thing, and we both said it. The longer this goes on, and remember, Hamas had this for 12 days, and it's not as if the world stood still in those 12 days. People were suffering throughout those 12 days. Uh, the longer this goes on, the more people will suffer. And it's time for the haggling to stop and a ceasefire to start. It's as simple as that. Um, look, Israel accepted the proposal as it was. And as it is, um, Hamas didn't. So I think it's pretty clear what, uh, what needs to happen. And we're determined in the, in the coming days to, again, try to work this. We will work this with urgency and see if the gaps that, that are, are workable, we can actually work and bring it to conclusion. And then it may be that Hamas continues to, to say no. Well, I think it will be clear to everyone around the world that it's on them, and that they that they will have made a choice to continue a war that they started. Regarding, I think, <coughs> your question about uh, how can we uh, have this uh, proposal to become a permanent ceasefire, this is an issue that we've been struggling with uh, for a very long time, uh, is how to ensure that uh, we bridge uh, the gap between those two fundamental differences between what Hamas wants as a uh, permanent ceasefire and what Israel wants as a hostage release and uh, uh, maybe uh, a plan to continue the war. I think what we have achieved uh, uh, in this structure is the best way to bridge those gaps and to merge uh, uh, both tracks. And I believe that uh, having uh, three countries uh, United States, Qatar, and Egypt uh, uh, as guarantor for this process to ensure that these negotiations uh, keeps going until we reach the permanent ceasefire is uh, something significant that we are putting ourselves at stake. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is, uh, as we mentioned many times, it's not an easy process, it's a very complex uh, negotiations. Uh, we are negotiating, yes, uh, to end the conflict that uh, started on October 7th. I think that uh, uh, it has a lot of baggage that came with uh, as well. And uh, basically what we are trying to focus on is to achieve the result that's been 
created after uh, October 7, right now, and thinking about the rest of, of the issue for uh, uh, once we have this deal in place. But uh, as of all of us, uh, we reiterate, this is uh, having a deal and a ceasefire right now is, is a cornerstone for our way forward uh, in the future. Thank you. Sala bin Javed Al Jazeera English. Uh, my question for Secretary Blinken um, I just want to go back to the words that you used. Uh, you said the deal was on the table, and yet there are workable parts that you will be working towards. Which one is it? Uh, it was there a deal, or is there still a deal on the table? And as the UN Security Council and the United Nations at large remains the cornerstone uh, for your policy towards finding a solution, today the latest UN investigation says Israel committed crimes against humanity, including extermination, uh, is the words used. And Israel is already facing a genocide case at the ICJ, uh, warrants for requests uh, at the ICC. And last month you said there are no red lines for Israel. Is that still the case? And if there is, what will this mean for yourself and the U.S. administration? Uh, my question for the Prime Minister, uh, is, isn't the first time that we are actually uh, very, came very close to a deal and then we seem to be moving away from it? Uh, you have said that there are two parties to this conflict, one that wants a negotiated solution and there's another one which wants to continue the war. Uh, do you believe that is still the case? And if you still have hope uh, that there can be a deal that can be salvaged, what gives you that hope? Thank you. Thank you. Look, as I said, we have a proposal that President Biden put forward 12 days ago. Um, Israel accepted the proposal. Uh, the entire world got behind the proposal. Hamas came back and has now asked for changes to that proposal. And I'll repeat what I said. Some of the changes um, I think we believe are workable, but some are not. Uh, and so we'll have to see over the coming days uh, whether the, the gaps that are there as a result of Hamas not accepting uh, with a clear and simple yes proposal, whether they can be bridged um, or not. And as I said, I believe that they are bridgeable, but that doesn't mean they will be bridged because ultimately Hamas has to decide. But I'll repeat again what I, what I said before. Uh, the time for decision is now. The longer this goes on, the more people will suffer. And when it took 12 days just to get the response to the proposal that President Biden put forward, suffering, more suffering took place during those 12 days. The longer this continues, the greater the suffering will be. And I fully agree with the Prime Minister. The, the fastest, most effective way to get to not just an immediate ceasefire, but a durable one, is through this proposal. So let's see if we can uh, bridge the remaining gaps. But fundamentally, uh, Hamas has to decide what it wants, and I can't, uh, I can't speak for it. When it comes to um, the, uh, the war and the conduct of, uh, of the war, uh, in response to the attacks of October 7th. Uh, we look and continue to look very carefully at international humanitarian law, at laws of armed conflict, uh, human rights, and we have a number of our own processes within the U.S. administration, including within my own department, to um, assess whether Israel or any other combatant in any other conflict is adhering to those. And as you know, uh, we put out a report uh, a few weeks ago that went through in some detail uh, a number of um, in incidents that have been raised, uh, both in terms of the um, loss of life and killing of uh, people, as well as the provision of humanitarian assistance. It's a very well-documented report, and we continue to do the work to make our own assessments. I haven't seen the most, recent, uh, the most recent, I think you said UN report that you referred to, but of course, we'll look at that. Um, again, the, 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 as I just said, uh, we are determined and insist that Israel or any other country adhere to uh, international humanitarian law, the laws of armed conflict, 
uh, uphold human rights, uh, not, does not commit uh, gross violations of those, uh, of those rights, uh, and that remains and will always remain our policy and the focus that we bring to it every day, including doing our own investigations of, uh, of incidents that come up in the course of this war. But I think that I have answered partially uh, your question regarding, uh, you know, trying to build a momentum to reach a deal. Of course, this is, you know, uh, has been a very uh, long process. Uh, it's frustrating a lot of times. And uh, we have seen, I mean, uh, the behavior from both parties different in different occasions being uh, you know counterproductive to to the efforts right now we are respecting our role as mediator we are trying our best not uh, uh, to consider ourselves as you know party of of that uh, conflict what we are aiming for is one specific goal is to end the war and to end the suffering of the people in gaza to get the hostages back and then we think about the day after that will remain our main focus. We are not going to give up on that mission as long as we see a role that we can play and we can contribute to save more lives. So, Rabah, Daphne Saladakis, Reuters. Hi, thank you. Secretary Blinken, do you agree with Israel's assessment that Hamas rejected the deal? And what specific changes were proposed by Hamas? What specifically do you find workable and not workable? Can you confirm that Hamas wants written guarantees from the United States for a permanent ceasefire and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip in order to sign off on the proposal? And can you provide those guarantees? And then if I may on Hezbollah, you've repeatedly said that achieving a ceasefire deal could help end the fighting between Hezbollah and Israel. Hezbollah today vowed to increase the intensity of its operations against Israel after the killing of a senior commander. How concerned are you now after Hamas's response to the ceasefire proposal that this conflict will spread? Uh, and Prime Minister, given this response, is there more pressure the Arab world can put on Hamas to reach a deal? And are you considering closing the Hamas office in Qatar? Thank you. So what we received last night, all of us in terms of the response from Hamas, were um, changes that they sought and they seek in the proposal that President Biden put forward that Israel and the entire world has accepted. Um, so the question is whether any of those changes that they have sought they seek are workable, um, bridgeable, or not. And I'm not going to obviously character, characterize or describe uh, what, uh, what they're looking for. Um, all I can tell you, having gone over this with our colleagues, is that we believe that some of the requested changes are workable and some are not. And so we have to see on an urgent basis over the course of the, uh, the, coming, uh, the coming days, um, whether those, uh, those gaps are bridgeable, in, again, uh, in a way that um, upholds the, the agreement, the proposal that President Biden puts on the table. Because uh, again, we're not, this is not about changing fundamentals, it's about seeing if we can bridge the, uh, the gaps that have been exposed by Hamas's response. And I can't, can't tell you right now whether we'll succeed. I believe it's doable. Uh, I believe it's absolutely necessary to try our hardest to do it, but there's no guarantee. Uh, with regard to Lebanon and, uh, and Hezbollah, look, we've said from day one that one of our primary objectives is to prevent this conflict, the conflict in Gaza, the war in Gaza from uh, spreading, seeing escalation in the region. And we've been on that from day one. Um, we don't want to see that escalation. And I think it's also safe to say that actually no one is looking to um, start a war to have uh, escalation. And I think it's also true that um, most involved uh, believe that uh, there can and should be ideally a diplomatic resolution to the differences that could spark conflict. And in particular, um, a resolution that 
uh, leads to the necessary conditions for people to be able to return to their homes and believe that they can live safely and securely in their own homes. There are about 60,000 Israelis who've had to leave their homes in northern Israel because of the uh, rocket attacks and, and the threat from Hezbollah. Um, they have to be able to go home. There are people in southern Lebanon who've also had to leave their homes. They should be able uh, to go home. So what I've heard from uh, everyone concerned and, and, and others who are working on this for every concern is there's a strong preference for a diplomatic solution. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the best way also to empower a diplomatic solution to the north, Lebanon, is a resolution of the conflict in Gaza, getting the ceasefire. That will take a tremendous amount of, of pressure out of the system. It will take away a justification that Hezbollah has claimed for the attacks it's engaged in, uh, and I think open a pathway to actually resolve this diplomatically. That's what we're determined to do. Um, the, the proposal speaks for itself. What's in the proposal, backed by the uh, United States, by Qatar, by Egypt, speaks for itself. Just <laughs> briefly on, on your question, I think that, uh, look, if we are talking about pressure, pressure needed to be on both parties. And we have seen that uh, basically, whether it's on Hamas or, or, or in Israel, but uh, uh, like for ex another example was 6th of May after that Rafah uh, invasion happened. And then also we have seen a lot of uh, uh, contradicting statements from uh, different Israeli officials that also requires a lot of pressure on them as well as, as the other party. We believe as a mediator, we try our best to respect our role, to bridge the gaps and not to make uh, uh, judgments for, on one party over another. And our uh, biggest concern is that it's taking too long to bridge these gaps. We need to get this to an end as soon as possible. That's what will remain our focus. Our focus is to put an end for this war, which took, I think it's the longest war that happened in, in, uh, uh, in Palestine. And this is something that no one can tolerate. The region cannot tolerate uh, more uh, instability. Regarding your question about Hamas office, we've been repeatedly uh, mentioning this Hamas office establishment in Doha be it for a reason. This reason is for keeping the communication channel. And until now, this reason is uh, uh, valid. And we are using this as a communication channel. Uh, our uh, uh, interest as a country is to see peace and stability in the region. It doesn't mean that we are endorsing one party over another. Uh, our policy is very clear in supporting the Palestinian people and their rights. But at the end of the day, we are a state, we are not a political party. Thank you. Shukran Malik, wa shukran al-Wazir al-Kharji al-Amriki, wa bihada. State Secretary, by this we conclude uh, this press conference for today.